Hi, in this video, I want to talk through uh, the answers to the study task on bivalves. So by now, you should have worked through the questions on the worksheet that goes with this video. If you haven't, press pause now and go and have a go at those questions. If you have, let's see what you've come up with. We have these two um, groups of fossils, species A and species B. These both belong to the same uh, group, uh, type of marine mollusk. Uh, fairly obviously, these are bivalves. You can see that um, if you try and draw equilateral symmetry for these shells, you, you can't do it. Any symmetry here is going to be equivalve symmetry, although it's not easy to tell from this particular data. Species B, at first glance, may look um, to have equilateral symmetry, but it doesn't quite. So these are bivalves. Also, we can see the inside view of both of these shells, and there isn't the distinctive um, sort of spiral type uh, structure within the shell that we get with brachiopods. Uh, inside a, a, a shell uh, for a bivalve, uh, it's an empty space for, for the animal to live. There's no internal supporting structure. It's the reason we eat bivalves, but we don't eat brachiopods. Anyway. Okay. The second question then asks you to describe two morphological differences between these species. Now you can pick any of these uh, to go at. Species A uh, has got ribs or crenulations or corrugations might be a better way of thinking about it on its shell. Species B uh, is smooth uh, on its surface. There's one mark for picking those out. There's another mark for talking about the paleal sinus. Uh, there's no paleal sinus uh, on species A. There is one on species B. Species A is uh, more rounded. The length and width are um, more similar. Species B is a bit more oval. The length and width are uh, a bit more different. I'm sure there are other ones you can uh, come up with. Anything, any other reasonable uh, suggestions uh, would probably be acceptable. If we then think about what this means about the mode of life, species A probably lived on the seabed or maybe just under the seabed uh, and uh, almost certainly moved around. It was able to propel itself a little bit. Uh, similar perhaps to a, a modern cockle. The evidence we can see from that that rough outer shell, that, those corrugations, are there to give the shell strength. That means it must have lived in a high energy environment. There must be um, a greater need for that shell to be uh, stronger to resist things like currents and also greater risk of predators. Also, we see a, a, a paleal line that sort of just goes straight from muscle to muscle. There's no um, siphon or no paleal sinus in this indicates it must live near the surface of the seabed not the sea species B on the other hand is very clearly a burrower there's uh, some distinct evidence for this we've got the paleal sinus very clear, clear, like, clear evidence of a burrowing mode of life. That's where the siphon for the bivalve would have been retracted back into the shell. The only bivalves that needed siphons are the burrowers. Also it has a smooth, quite streamlined shell, which allowed it to, to dig quickly and easily down into the mud. Indicates this one uh, lived not just below the surface, but a, you know a good way below the surface.
We then have some data about the fossil assemblages uh, of these um, particular species. So we have uh, species A and species B, and we've got an example uh, of a shell from species A there for you to measure. Uh, we should get an answer somewhere up there. I measured it to be about 37 millimetres wide and about 35 millimetres long. You get a mark for each measurement. So if you had uh, one of those measurements right and the other one's wrong, then you will get one mark for that. Two marks for getting it exactly the right place. If we look at the distribution uh, of data then for species A, we see uh, a, a widespread across this graph. Now this is um, characteristic um, with a range of sizes, therefore a range of ages of a bivalve. A bivalve gets bigger with, uh, uh, with age. That this then is most likely to be a life assemblage. We've got a whole community here, juveniles and, more, and mature adults, fossilized clearly in the one event. Species B then has been interpreted as a death assemblage. If we look at spe species B, we can see that we've got a different distribution of data here. The data is, is very clearly clustered. So the student who's, ident who's interpreted this as a death assemblage uh, is correct. There's a very limited range of, of sizes and of ages of these um, particular fossils. And the environment in which they're found uh, on a modern beach is the type of environment that where the shells of dead bivalves will get washed up. We also see from the um, initial data that uh, it suggests that there's some evidence of damage to the shells as well. So that could also be added as one of your answers. The fact that this uh, has more evidence of being transported. So, to conclude. Bivalves give us lots of interesting data. Uh, particularly on uh, the relationship between the morphology of the shells and the way that they live. The fact that they're uh, extant, they still live today, they still live in a, a huge range of environments, means that we can um, look at modern bivalves and interpret the features we find in fossil bivalves because they're, they're the same as the ones we see today. So we can be very confident in interpreting uh, how these lived and how they died. What we need to do next then is think about how we'd apply that to a group of organisms that aren't extant, that uh, became extinct a long time ago and perhaps have no real close living relatives. That group is the incredibly diverse group of the trilobites. But that's for another lesson. I'll see you then.